Thank you, Father John, so much for talking to me today. Um, I am going to talk to you about your new book, Dying to Live. Um, we'll just get straight to it, I suppose. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how it came about? Well, as I put it in my introduction, this book was not my idea. It's uh, an extraordinary beginning of a book because a friend came on a retreat. It's now January of 2021. And... He was chatting with me, as men will do on a retreat, and he suggested, wouldn't it be good if there were a book about life after death for people who don't believe in it? And I immediately took to the idea for two reasons. One, I wasn't aware that there was such a book, and it would be a very, very valuable book to have because many people don't believe in life after death, or they just wonder, is there and they live their lives accordingly. And secondly, I thought, I've already written half this book. I've been writing a column for the Catholic Weekly every week for the last 18 years, and I had written a lot on life after death, on a number of other aspects of this that fed into this book. So I've already written half the book. Obviously, I had to rewrite it and put it all together in a logical format. So that's how the book came about. Then, over the next some like something like ten months, uh, I was able to write the book. Helped by COVID, the lockdown in Sydney, which came at the end of June, two thousand and twenty-one. The school where I'm chaplain, Tangara School for Girls, was closed. At least the chaplains weren't going, so I had about two months or more when I wasn't coming into the school, and I could spend a lot of time writing the book. So helped by COVID. The book got written in what would be reasonably record time mm -hmm. on that topic. And from the beginning, there were some criteria that we were trying to observe, which was, in the first place, this book has to be short. We want this for people who might be dying, nearing the edge of, end of life because they're getting old, or maybe they're sick. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not going to read a big, thick book about this. It can't be heavy in the sense of, of, of the number of pages, and it can't be heavy in the language. It must be a light, conversational tone. So it was, the book was going to be short. Then another thing that I realized as I was writing it was, if the book is short and you want to cover a number of topics, the chapters should be short, too. Mm. So we uh, tried to observe that. I say we, suggested by this friend who was, remains uh, a very good friend, and I gave him an autographed copy of the book. <laughs> he was very happy with it. And so I, I took something else, believe it or not, from Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, which I actually read. I wasn't going to read it, and then I thought, let's read it. Somebody gave me a copy, so I read it. And one of the aspects of the book as, a, as a, a book about Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene in the history of the church, it's just errant nonsense all the way through. Mm -hmm. But as a thriller, I thought this book is exceptionally good mm -hmm. because you get to the end of a chapter and you're hanging on a cliff and you've got to find out what happens after this. So you look ahead, how long is the next chapter? Oh, it's only three pages. So you keep on writing, re reading. And so I adopted a little bit of that technique at the end of some of the chapters to show the reader this brings us to the next logical question, which is this. That's the topic of the next chapter. So it can help the reader to want to go on and find out what um, is in that next chapter. Mm -hmm. And one lady who's a mother of four or five children wrote to me after she had read the book. She said, I read it all in one day. Mm -hmm. I couldn't put it down. So maybe that Dan Brown aspect of leading the reader at the end of a chapter into the next chapter helped her to keep on going. <laughs> I don't know how she did it. Yeah. Mm. That's great. Who, thought, yeah. who would have thought Dan Brown would have helped you with this? <laughs> no, not Dan Brown. Not the Da Vinci Code. So um, you mentioned talking a little bit about the structure of the book. Is that what mm. you meant? That yeah, type of structure. so the structure, mm -hmm. when I look back on it, it's amazing when you've done something, you look back on it, you see things you never envisioned while you were writing it. Mm. 
But in a, the book, in essence, is divided into two parts. Part one is what you can call apologetics, arguing from reason to show there has to be life after death. And then part two is what is the Catholic view on life after death. So this is not so much apologetics as Catholic doctrine. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, the really good book by Archbishop Michael Sheehan, uh, his Apologetics and Catholic Doctrine, that's divided too into an apologetic part and then into Catholic doctrine. So this book has in its second part the Catholic view on death, he heaven, death judgment, heaven, purgatory, hell. And, and then the final chapter is what must I do? So hopefully the reader, well, the reader is still with us if they get to the final chapter. Now they're open to the question, what must I do to get this eternal life that you speak about so positively in this book? And it's just practical ways that they can change their life for the better, perhaps get back to the church of their upbringing if they had one, and, and prepare to, to face our Lord in the judgment. And so it, it develops in a very logical way. Then the, the reader gets to the end and at least is open to the question and can uh, ad adjust their life accordingly and hopefully mm -hmm. get to heaven. And that's one of the hopes of the book, that it will help many people get to heaven. People who maybe didn't believe in life after death, now they know there is that and, and they're preparing for it. And, um, and uh, that's one of it, and life after death is eminently positive. We don't present God as the God of wrath, the God of judgment, the God of punishment, but the God of mercy, the God of love, mm. which is what he is. And he wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And hopefully this book will help people to, to come to the knowledge of the truth and, and be saved and, and be forgiven by God no matter how many sins they've committed. Mm -hmm. So you say, though, that the, there's obviously a lot of the Catholic doctrine in there, but on the book I noticed you went by John Flatter and not Father John Flatter. Was yes. there a reason for that? There is a reason for that. That was done with malice aforethought. Mm -hmm. We did not want to scare away any potential reader who might pick up the book in a bookshop or maybe mm -hmm. given it by a friend and say, ah, this is written by a priest. Mm. And there's no imprimatur by a bishop or a Neil Obstath by a censor. We wanted to avoid that altogether, so the author just appears as my name on the back. It doesn't <coughs> mention that I'm a priest. It just says where I studied in the United States and, mm -hmm. and in Spain and what I've been doing in Australia since 1968. So the reader at least is not going to get scared off by the presentation of the book. They might get scared off as they go through the book, but I hope not, because when all is said and done, we're all going to die. Mm. And as it says at the top of the, 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 the back cover, and always many, many books have the first paragraph on the back cover is what is this book about? And let's just read it. We are all going to die. Now, that applies to everybody. But what happens after that is the big question. Many don't believe in life after death, or they wonder if there just might be something on the other side. This book is for them. It leads the reader gently and logically along a path of inquiry into this vital question, arguing from reason and experience. We can all have our opinions but what awaits us after death does not depend on what we think is going to happen. There is reality out there. And as this book shows, the reality is eminently positive and it fills us with hope. So it may provoke in a potential reader on picking up the book the desire to find out at least what does this writer have to say about life after death, because it does not depend on what we think is going to happen. There is reality. There mm -hmm. is a God, as this book shows. So, and it also invites reading because the reality is eminently positive and it fills us with hope. Mm 
Mm. And that's what we want, that a reader pick it up and read it, because mm. what awaits us after death is full of hope. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you think, Father, that it is possible for somebody to believe there is an afterlife, but not necessarily that there's a God? Now, that's a very interesting question. I, I have thought about it, but you put the two together always, and if there's no God, then we have to ask the question, how did this universe begin, and, and why is it that we can even think about the question of life after death, and we have a spiritual soul that allows us to do this. So I haven't really gone through that question um, in a very thorough way in my own mind, but without a God, it's most unlikely that there's life after death because we just are a product of, of, of matter. Mm. And uh, matter somehow threw itself into existence 13.8 billion years ago. And by the way, the chapter on the existence of God argues from, from scientific evidence from the 20th century on the origin of the universe. How did it begin? Because scientists now are convinced before this universe, before this Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, there was nothing. Mm. And now there's something, lots of it, hundreds of billions of galaxies of it. How did that happen? It seems there has to be a God. How did life begin 3.5 billion years ago? Life, this, the complexity of the simplest single cell organism the complexity of DNA and, and other arguments from science to show there has to be a God. And God is spiritual, and he made human beings spiritual with a spiritual soul. The very fact that we can think about God, that we can think about life after death. Animals can't do this. Mm. The universe is not just composed of matter. There are human beings and angels, for that matter, with spirit. Where did spirit come from, had to come from God? And it's only because we are spiritual that there's life after death. So if there's no God, and somehow, somehow, the universe put itself together, and all is matter, then there's no life after death. So God is spiritual, he made us spiritual, and there's life after death because we are spiritual. And when all is said and done, you cannot destroy something spiritual. God could annihilate it. But a body can be burned, a body can be destroyed in one way or another. It's going to decompose. But spirit is indestructible unless it's annihilated by the Creator. So mm -hmm. God and, and life after death go together. They do. Mm. Another kind of proof that you use in your book is um, amazing near-death experiences. There's a lot of these mm. stories in there. First of all, I was just wondering, where do you source these stories? How do you find out about them? Okay, that's, that, the topic of near-death experiences <clears throat> is crucial to the development mm. of this book. Because we can argue that, yes, there's a soul. Yes, there's an aspiration of the human being to something beyond this life. Like, we don't find complete happiness here. And some of the richest people are very unhappy. They thought money would give them happiness, or maybe cars, or travel, or properties, but they don't have it. There's, we long for something beyond. So there's many arguments for, for life after death. But when you get to near-death experiences, we're looking at people who had generally a cardiac arrest, mm. they were clinically dead, and the soul, which we have argued for very early on in the book, leaves the body. There's a soul, it's something spiritual. It leaves the body, the body's dead. The soul is alive, and it has various experiences from hovering over the body, looking down at it, going through a tunnel to the, the light, which is God, experiencing what they call the life review, and that's the title mm -hmm. I've given to the chapter on the judgment. Some have gone to hell, some have gone to purgatory. Where do we get these, these stories? Mm. There's a number of books that have all been bestsellers, and I looked at two of them, where uh, uh, in one case a psychiatrist, in another case a radiation oncologist, have examined and spent their, their, the last part of their lives examining near-death experiencing 
thousands and thousands of documented cases. And when I was writing the book, in the course of writing it, I've come to know of more people that I personally know oh, who wow. have had some aspect of a near-death experience. Then there's a lot of them, individual stories on the net. People were pointing these out to me, and I was very grateful to some of these people for pointing out stories that they're true. And some people would say, oh, you can't believe that. Well, I challenge anybody to go to the sources and look at the ones that I've quoted in the book mm -hmm. and listen to what that person says and say he's lying, he's making up a story. You can never conclude that. It is so genuine. Mm. And so when you look at some of these near-death experiences on the net, listen to what they have to say, see how the near-death experience has changed their life for the better, which is invariably the case, then you are convinced. So the near-death experiences show us the reality of what happens in, in life after death, and it happens to coincide perfectly with Christian and better Catholic doctrine mm. on those realities. There is the separation of the soul. There is a judgment. And one of the aspects of the judgment that I was intrigued by, which I had never read anywhere except in these, these books about near-death experiences, was the person is sometimes allowed to feel what the other person felt when, let us say, I insulted them or helped them. So it's not only what did I do, but how did another person feel when I did it? That is awesome and perhaps in some ways frightening. But <laughs> a, a good number of people have had that experience. So I dare say when we go through our judgment, we may have that experience too, to know what somebody else felt. So the near-death experiences reveal the, the, the very realities that the Catholic Church speaks about mm -hmm. and that I preach about when I'm giving a retreat. I'm giving one this coming weekend. Uh, so there's, there's, there's death. There's, there's judgment, there's heaven, and the beauty of heaven, and especially as, as people experienced it in their near-death experience, just overwhelming joy. There is purgatory, and a few have gone to purgatory or experienced passing by it and seeing in the case of Gloria Polo, this Colombian orthodontist, mm. as she passed by purgatory, she saw her parents in purgatory. She says, my dad was farther down and my mother was, was closer to going to heaven. And there's hell. And a number of people, including one that I know here in Sydney, have experienced hell. And there's a story of the priest, Father Stephen Shire from the U.S. So... There's, there's compelling evidence for life after death. Mm. <laughs> and, um, and then, um, so we, um, we have this title, um, Dying to Live, and I must say, as the book was being written, it went through various um, stages of titles. We started out as suggested by the, the man who suggested the book. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a title like Nearing the Finish Line. Mm -hmm. But as I was writing the book, I was thinking to myself, this book isn't about nearing the finish line. It's about what happens from the starting line once you've finished this life. So it's really not about the, the life at the end of life here, but it's about what happens after death. Mm -hmm. then, then I was looking at titles like, Is There Life After Death? or titles that involve that. And I put this to a number of people that we were gathered and I get together and I was telling them about the book and I said, look, these are the various titles I've been playing around with. Anybody have any ideas? And somebody came up immediately with Dying to Live. And I thought, that's a tremendous catchy title. And then what I did was you go to Google and you see if there's any other books with that title. And I came up with, I think, about six books that begin Dying to Live. And if oh, you go wow. to Amazon, or the book depository where my book is, is also listed, you will find five or six different books that all have that as the initial title, but all have a, a secondary or subtitle, and they're all very different. So I thought there's no danger in giving this book this title, yeah, and great. with this, the, the subtitle makes it very distinct. Yeah. Mm. Um, 
Okay, so back on the near-death experiences, I have two questions about this. Why do you think God allows these to happen? One. And two, does that affect that person's freedom? Because then they, I suppose, essentially had a taste of heaven, a taste of something beyond. Mm. <clears throat> like you said, it makes changes in their lives. Is that still a free change in their lives or have they been given something that the rest of us haven't? <laughs> <laughs> Very good questions. Question number one. You, in your question, formulated it as I personally see it, and some people might want to doubt that very question. You asked, why does God allow this? Now, God allows everything that happens in the universe. We know that. We are people who believe. But if someone doesn't believe in God, they would try to explain it away by some process of neurons in the brain and cardiac arrests and brainal brain um, functions afterwards that might explain this. Uh, personally, I don't think that's the case. I believe that God allows it in some cases. Why doesn't he allow it in more? In how many does he allow it? The, the persons that have analyzed these give various percentages, but... It's, it's a small percentage, but one of them was talking about maybe 40% or 20% of those who have a cardiac arrest. Because normally, after a cardiac arrest, many people die. Mm. And of course, they can't talk about it. And, and other people are revived, but they didn't have any experience while they were unconscious. So I think God allows it. He allows it so that these people who might not have been saved, will be saved in the case of those who are on their way to hell. And there's a good number of stories of that in the book. And, and for all of them, they change their life for the better, and they can talk about it to other people. So many of these have led to books, and there's many, many books by the individuals who had the, the near-death experience. Eben Alexander is the psychiatrist from the States, taught at Harvard Medical School at one stage and other medical schools. He did not believe in life after death. He did not believe in near-death experiences. He was just adamant. He, he couldn't, couldn't understand these until he had one himself, and then he wrote his book. So the books and the talks that they give, the organizations that they form to, to promote belief in life after death all are God allowing them to help many other people believe. So I think God allows it so that mm. they, in turn, first of all, will change their life because invariably they all change their life for the better. This, this is a constant. And they will be able to help many other people change their lives. Then, freedom. I, I would like to put it in a way that perhaps you weren't expecting, but a person, I think, who has had a near-death experience is more free than the rest of us to live their life in a good way. Because if we could only see God, if, if everybody had a near-death experience and we realized there is heaven and God is a God of love and he is there and heaven is, is pure bliss, it is just unadulterated happiness, then I think more people would, would live their lives in a different way and get to heaven. They are more free to live out the purpose of existence. Because after all, now we can go back to children's catechisms. And I, I still remember learning um, when I was very little. We had catechism in the, at the parish because in the United States there's no religious instruction in the state schools, and there still isn't. But on, on the first page of a children's catechism was the question, why did God make me? And believe it or not, in the catechism of the Catholic Church, that question is asked in slightly different form, and the answer is virtually the same. Why did God make me? What is the meaning of life? God made me to know, love, and serve him on earth in order to be happy with him forever in heaven. That's the, the meaning of life. That's the purpose of life. And if people realize there's heaven and there's a loving God, then they would 
be able to live out their life in order to obtain the very meaning and purpose of their life more. Near-death experiences have helped those who had the experience to change their life for the better. They're more free now to live their life in the way that they really ought to. And, and they've helped many others as well. So hopefully this book will help many people as well to, to find out what life is all about and to obtain the, 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 the goal. I'm sure mm. it will. Okay, so reading this book and knowing the theory of it, heaven sounds amazing. It sounds like something mm. I can't wait for. But coming back to daily life, I have to admit it scares me a little bit, that transition into the, into the next life, into the unknown. Do you, can you honestly say that you are looking forward to the next life without any fear of all this? I don't know. For me, it's still, maybe I'm being too human about it. I think many believers like you mm. have a certain apprehension. Mm. <laughs> because when I die, I'm going to close my eyes and my soul is going to leave my body. Am I going to be conscious as I go through the stages of the judgment and and the tunnel, if there's a tunnel, and, and experience, let's say, heaven, or maybe go to purgatory, which is also a very, very happy state. Um, personally, I haven't faced that because I feel very healthy and uh, death is near. I suspect that as the average person nears death itself, they might become somewhat apprehensive and, and say, is this all for real? <laughs> we can't be scared of heaven. We can't be scared even of purgatory because it's so happy, and even though they're suffering there. But I think that that uncertainty of what happens might lead to a, a certain degree, not as necessarily a fear, but of, of, um, of apprehension and un, it's uncertainty. Um, so the book hopefully can put people's fears at rest and, and fill them more with hope. But I dare say, and as so many have said, when all is said and done, we die alone. We can be surrounded by loved ones. But in the end, that soul is, is yours and you're going to face God and you die wondering. I'm, I'm alone. This, I, I go through this tunnel. <laughs> you, you people don't go through it with me. But a beautiful story is out of Ellie. Mm. Because who book, inspired the book? Is, oh, who de yeah. you dedicated to? Yeah, the book to. is dedicated to Ellie. Mm. Now, Ellie is Ellie Egan from Sydney, whom I accompanied for five years, from, from October 13th, um, 2016. She was 15, not year nine girl here in Tangara. And she goes away from school early that day to go to get some results from the doctors of some tests that have been done. She sends out a text message to her friends that night, I have brain cancer. And it was a very aggressive tumor in the brain stem, which is inoperable and incurable. And your prog prognosis of life is nine months. And she went through various stages of fear, of anger, and whatnot. But through the help of her mother, she settled down. She accepted this was the will of God. And at the very end of her life, which, as I say, <laughs> coincided with finishing this book, I was going through the book, just going through the final edit. And when you write something like this, you go through it numerous times, not as many as I do when I write my columns for the Catholic Weekly, or by the time I've sent it off, I've gone through it at least 10 or 12 times, maybe more, just changing a comma here and a word there. But with a whole book, you just can't do that. Your book would never finish, so you have to declare it finished. And I was just going through the final edit um, of the last chapter when Illy died, and I got news of that, and I went to see her. And then what her mother said was, was so impressive. She had a, a urinary tract infection, which was going to end her life. She had been not eating for more than eight weeks. They're not too sure exactly when she stopped eating, but she should have died long before that. But she's, she stayed alive. Then she got the urinary tract infection at the age of 20. She was then five years and a few months into her, into her cancer. And over the course of that time, through perhaps a little bit helped by me as I 
went to visit her and passed on ideas from the book and the beauty of heaven and so on. She was really looking forward to dying. And early in the morning, she died about 11.30 on that Monday morning. Um, the family was with her, of course, and her mother was there and, and the cousin and others in the room. And about one or two in the morning, when it looked like she was just getting towards the end, her mother said, Ellie, our lady's coming to get you. And I bet you can't wait. Mm. And and her only form of communication, and this goes back weeks, perhaps even months, she could not communicate in with voice. That was many, many months without her voice. But she could move her left hand a little bit to point to letters and spell things out or point to words like yes or no or pain or hunger or whatever. But at the end, her only form of communication was eyes. And as her sister Leah explained in an interview that she did later for a podcast, when she moved her eyes up and down, that was yes. And if there was no movement, that was no. So that was the only way she could communicate. So her mother says, Our Lady's coming to get you, to take you to heaven, and I bet you can't wait. And her mother said her eyes went up and <laughs> And down in the most emphatic way, I can't wait, is what she was saying. Then she lapsed into the coma and died some maybe 10 hours later. But it was a beautiful death of somebody who was looking forward to it. And let us all pray that we can look forward to it when the, the time comes and not be afraid. When you hear about these, so uh, there was a study in the book by Dr. Raymond Moody that you mentioned. Yeah. And he kind of talked about different changes that people feel when they've come out of a near-death experience. So but there was about eight things they have in common. And one of them was that they no longer fear death and they might even long for it. But then the other one was that they then want to live their life to the full. To me, could that be a bit contradictory? It's like, why would you, if you're so excited for death, why then live your life well in the details? Oh, I think that's obvious in the sense that you don't know when you're going to die. Many of these people with near-death experiences were quite young. And of course, Colton Burple, the one that led to the, the book and the, and the film, Heaven is for Real, he was four. So if you've had one of those, then after that, when you're young, you're healthy, you've had a cardiac arrest, obviously, you were very ill at some point, but you come back and often you're, you're cured of whatever it was and, and you're healthy, then you're, you're filled with joy, you want to live your life to the full so that you can g obtain that goal which is heaven later. And um, I think you're looking forward to heaven but you realize I have to stay here on earth for whatever time remains. And, and for all of us, um, especially those of us with faith, and St. Josemaria says this and I often quote that on retreats, he says, we've got to live as long as possible because God has so few friends on earth mm. and there's so much work to do. And it's not just for ourselves that we will live longer. We can maybe merit more, a higher place in heaven or more happiness there. But other people need us. They need us to give them a good example, pass on God's word and his truth to them, help them to see there's, there's heaven, there's life after death. God is a God of love and, and compassion and forgiveness. So there's a lot to do. So we want to live our life to the full, live as long as we can to help as many people along the way to get to heaven. And we don't go alone. We go along with a lot of other people that we helped. Hmm. And you touched on this as well, but I will just ask you officially, what are your hopes for the book? Who would you like ah, to speak to? Very good question. Now, this is... This is um, something I thought a lot about when I started writing it to, to help people realize there is life after death and it is eminently positive. And, and now that the book is finished and people are reading it and, and people are buying it in multiple copies to give to relatives, friends, people who need it, who may not believe in life after death, giving it to non-Catholics as well. I hear many stories of people giving it to, to non-Catholics. My hope is that, first hope, it will help many people get to heaven 
who might not otherwise have got there. They will realize, I have to change my life in something. I have to be sorry for my sins. They will get to heaven when perhaps they might not otherwise have got there. So help many people get to heaven. I think, and I put this in the last chapter, what must I do? Help people to get back to the religion of their upbringing if they had one. So if they were a good Hindu or a Buddhist or a Muslim or a, a, a Quaker or whatever it was, go back to your religion. Those people that you grew up with will help you. There's a community there. They will welcome you. They, they can strengthen you in your resolve to live a better life because all religions, they're not all the fullness of truth that the Catholic Church is. But they all have elements of truth and goodness. In fact, the Second Vatican Council said in the document on, on um, the dogmatic constitution on the Church Lumen, Lumen Gentium, whatever elements of goodness and truth are found in other religions, the Catholic Church considers as a preparation for the gospel. There's, there's goodness and truth in all religions. This can help people. So it will help many people go back to the religion of their upbringing and change their life for the better and get to heaven. It will help people come back to the Catholic Church. I, I dare say there's so many people in, in this country of Australia who are not practicing their Catholic faith. The immense majority are not going to Mass on Sundays. It will help many of them to come back. And I really think it will help a good number of people, and this is in the hands of God, to come into the Catholic Church because the apologetic section on life after death, on Jesus Christ, on the Bible, and on the Catholic Church. It's all of short chapters, but there's, there's enough argument there, enough truth there to lead people to think, I have no religion myself, they might say, I would like to belong to this church which has the fullness of the teachings, the truth, and the means of salvation that the Catholic Church has. So. That would be one of my hopes, that it will bring people into the church as well. That's mm. awesome. I'm sure it will, Father. Thank you so much. I think we'll end there. Okay. Okay.